Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and what an honor to come and share with you this afternoon what the real world is all about. And no, that's not something like The Matrix. Can I just ask a question? How many of you have actually seen the movie? Going back about 15, 20 years ago. Okay, so most people are quite aware of the challenges that was presented by the movie concerning what is real. And if we look at all the various definitions of worldview, and we'll get to some of them in a moment, that's really what the major question is all about. What is reality. And most of us sitting in this room might frame reality in a certain way. Well, looking over the crowd this afternoon, we have people of various different cultural backgrounds, various different races, various different uh, worldviews. And we might come to a shocking discovery this afternoon that there are definitely some different fundamental orientations or fundamental views in the world that might differ. But before we get there, just in short, uh, Ron already did a great introduction. Uh, we're part of Seaside Professional. Uh, the Lifewood Leadership process is also very closely associated with us. Uh, we've been running with it for the past uh, four years now, and it's always a privilege to, to come and serve uh, the body of Christ and also the people who are obviously growing within the context of leadership in various organizations. Our specific focus is what we call human capital development, focusing on leadership development and various other areas also. And worldview, amongst many other things, is but one of the critical aspects that we need to consider. So I want to start off this afternoon by asking the question, what is your worldview? Do you quickly want to plot that? It's quite an interesting concept. You're welcome to Google it and just type in worldview and images or worldview or what is your worldview and then try and navigate yourself through this maze of different understandings. This is specifically focusing on the theistic understanding which relates to God, which relates to our spirituality. There are many other concepts also dealing with worldview. But I assume most of us in this room will most probably end off somewhere within this block which they call Christian theism or at least theism or deism. Uh, there are various other ways in which people also consider and look at the world. Why is this quite important for us to understand as leaders? Well, Barna's research brought some interesting statistics to the forefront. Barna said that, uh, according to their research, this was about three or four years ago, only 9% of born-again Christians consider to have a biblical worldview. Only 9%. And that 9%, only 7% would identify with what we call the Protestant Christian belief. So the question is, where's the rest of the 90% of Christians in the world? What kind of worldview, what kind of definition do they give to the world and how it looks and how it works? If you read the entire article by Barnard, it says the following. The most important point is that you can't give people what you don't have. The low percentage of Christians to have a biblical worldview is a direct reflection of the fact that half of our primary religious teachers and leaders do not have one. Can I just see how many people here today is in the context of full-time ministry or church ministry or relating to the <coughs> leadership world in the church world? Okay, we've got quite a couple of hands going up. In some denominations, they found that the vast majority of clergy do not have a biblical worldview, and it shows up clearly in the data related to their theological views, and also quite interesting to the moral choices of people who attend those churches. We're not here to bash the church. This is just the reality we are faced with. So in a very interesting book by a guy called Sire, he gave us a more academic uh, definition of what worldview is. So I'm going to try and jump through this quite quickly. Sire says the following, it is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions, and here's the interesting part, it's assumptions which may be true, partly true, or even entirely false, which we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, and I think this is the main focus for the afternoon. It is about the basic construct of reality. So if we ask the question for Neo, what is real? We need to ask this question about what is reality that provides the foundation on which we live and we move and we have our being. That is the critical conversation. Now, worldview goes into many different questions. First of all, the reality. It deals with the past. It deals with the future. It deals with aspects of values. 
It deals with our action and behavior and also what we consider to be knowledge. So just looking at these concepts and walking within the business world or in the nonprofit sector or whichever area you might be representing, these are the fundamental questions that people bring into the workspace, not only concerning themselves but ultimately also the way how they relate to other people. If we come with the presupposition that the world is quite simplistic, everybody seems to be like me and do like me, we're going to run into vast problems the moment you are confronted with other cultures and other people because fundamentally people might be considering life to be quite different than where you are. So before we go into a model, I just want to highlight something about Jesus' view on the world. This is, this is quite nice. Jesus said to the people in John 5, 19, he said, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by Himself. Just reflect on that for a moment. Jesus' own words. The Son can do nothing by Himself. If I had to ask the question, how many of you are independent here? And Jesus was actually proclaiming He is not independent. He can do nothing out of Himself because He can only do what He sees His Father doing. So everything, starting from Matthew all the way to the end of John, all four of the Gospels, was a reflection of what Jesus saw the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So if you ask me this afternoon, Michelle, what is a biblical worldview? I think a biblical worldview is quite locked up within that statement. Jesus didn't have an actual Bible like we have it today. Jesus' point of departure, or the way in which he viewed the world, his values, his morals, his engagement, his theological orientation, his spirituality, every aspect was a reflection of what he saw the Father doing. Yes, we have the Bible. Yes, we have leaders within the domain of the church and every other sphere also that helps us to understand and how to live this out. But for Jesus, there was no other point of departure. He did not do what the Romans asked of him. He did not do what the Hellenistic worldview at that stage dictated for the Jewish people. He didn't even conform to the standards of Judaism. What Jesus did was only in relation to what the Father showed him. There is another verse that he said, I do nothing except when I hear my Father telling me to do it. That was Jesus' point of view when it came to worldview. So I want to introduce just a short little model this afternoon. I'm sure everybody has come across something like this before. We call it the iceberg model, of which we have various layers that helps us just to understand where does worldview fit into this larger conversation of our life. And I think the beautiful thing about the iceberg is the fact that there's very little that we actually see. So, I can't remember the exact science, but apparently if you take a little ice cube and you throw it within your glass of water, there's only a short or small little section that floats above the water, something like 17 to 20 percent of the entire mass. And the reason for that water, unlike any other substance, is not at its most dense form when it actually changes into a fixed form. In other words, the density increased right to about 4 or 3 degrees Celsius, and then between that point and when it changed into a fixed form, the engineers and physicists must probably know this better, it actually loses density again. Otherwise, the block of ice would have sinked right to the bottom of the glass. But it floats. And that's the reason why the Titanic, if you go back to, what's it, 98, Kate and Leo's little nice movie that we all saw, with the Titanic passing by the iceberg, and then it struck the iceberg. What happened? It didn't actually ram right into the iceberg, it passed on the side. But what the people didn't see was not the little piece that stuck out, it was the vast majority of the ice mountain that was underneath the water that was submerged. And what in fact happened when it passed by the iceberg, it hit the bow underneath the water, I think five different spaces, which caused the ship to sink, ultimately. This is a very good metaphor for people, person's life. What we see is the actions and the behaviors that sticks up. What we see is the performance within the workspace. What we see is the interactions amongst people. But that's a very small percentage of who we are. The vast majority of our life is actually that mass, the critical space that's underneath the water. So the question begs, if we want to change the behavior of our people, if we want to have increased performance, if we want to see more healthy relationships, how do we do that? Well, to move an iceberg, you have two choices. You can either get a gale force wind to blow 
on the top side that's sticking out of the water. That's called behavioral modification. It doesn't work. Why? Because a wind that blows on an iceberg doesn't move it, it actually just erodes the thing away. If you want to move an iceberg in the ocean, you need to change the currents, which is beneath the water. That's where worldview becomes critical. As leaders, I believe it is one of our fundamental tasks to help create the currents that's under the water, or at least steer them in the right direction. And part of that conversation is what we see as values, our values in action, or organizational culture, many different elements to that, the belief systems that we hold, and I'm not talking here about necessarily religious belief systems, I'm talking about empowering beliefs within our workspace, I'm talking about beliefs that there is enough work in our country, or beliefs that yes, we can become profitable, or in the non-profit world, beliefs that yes, we can impact the city of ours and our nation for the greater cause, or do we have limiting beliefs that's hindering us in what we need to do? You see, but ultimately, even our beliefs is based on a way we view the world. One of the metaphors, I believe you guys had a little video clip from the Truth Project. The guys like Ravi Zacharias and these guys gave a bit of introduction. If you haven't seen it, please take some time to just quickly consider that on the way home tonight or before you get into bed. One of the authors there, I think it was Os Guinness or one of the guys says, it's like a lens, it's like a pair of glasses that you put on and through these glasses you look at the world, you engage with the world. What does that mean for us on a practical day-to-day -day basis? Let me give you two practical examples of worldview and how it impacts us within the workspace. One of the concepts of worldview that's critical is our understanding of time. If you ask a person, what is time? It's actually quite a difficult concept to explain to another person. Everybody knows what time is. I've got a watch or uh, I, I sense there's a passing of events or I'm trying to explain it. But to really have a vivid picture of time, it's, it's a very difficult thing to capture. Well, there are different ways in which people try to express it. In the world, there are different approaches to time. That's part of the worldview. Most people in this room comes from a more Western background, I would guess, if I look just at the faces sitting around the table. So the Western worldview looks at time as a very linear thing, a straight line. You have a start, there's a progression, and then you have a conclusion. I have a start to this day in life of leadership, there was a specific time, and there is a conclusion, and I'm very aware of the fact that that conclusion is not me, but supper waiting for you guys. So I'm trying to hurry through this at a certain speed. That's a linear concept. African worldview, and I see a lot of African gentlemen and ladies in the room also, understands time in quite a similar way. There's a start, there's a progression, and there's an end. Does anybody in the room fundamentally see time different? than this kind of linear scale. May I ask for a hand, if somebody fundamentally said, time does not work like that. We have one hand, okay? That's quite the exception, just by the way. You might be surprised to hear that more than half of the world's population does not view time as a linear progression. That's the Oriental or the Asian worldview which sees time as a circular event. We go round and round and round. Here's the interesting thing. Let's quickly talk about beliefs. Let's talk about religion. The Western world and the African world believes when we live, we are born, we live a life, we die, and then there's a next kind of dispensation or a next existence after that, which is completely different. All the major religions of the West and Africa has that in common. The African traditional religion believes that. Christianity believes that. Judaism believes that. Islam believes that. What happens when you go to the Far East, who has a circular notion of time, concerning their belief system? Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, all of them have in common a cycle called karma. And a process of reincarnation where you repeat your life either as a higher form of being or as a lower manifestation in your next life. And we see fundamentally how belief systems were born and flowed out of their time orientation. 
So I'm not going to speak about the oriental view. I'm still struggling after 20 years of studying this to understand how you come back as a fruit fly or if you had a better life of Ramon Bias. So let's leave that for the moment. The fact is most people in this room understand something of a linear progression. We Western view and African view, and I'm talking general now, the classical way, differs fundamentally, is the relationship between this line and the individual himself. So in Western thoughts, which is the Greco-Roman way of looking at it, time is constant. There's nothing I can do to speed up time. I'm not talking about some sci-fi thing like the Matrix where time is quicker or Einstein's theory. Literally every second of every day is every second for every day for the rest of my life. If I don't use this minute or this moment, it is lost. I am relative. That's why we are working ourselves to death, because we have a future orientation. I need to do something now in order that every step from this point forward will look better or it's greater opportunities. If I don't do anything now, I can't expect to have a more prosperous future. The African view is quite the opposite. In Africa, because of their strong sense of Ubuntu, and I'll get to that worldview statement in a moment, works the opposite way around. It is the person that's constant because of the high understanding of social infrastructure. That's why we have statements like African time. Or when you deal with a very traditional African mindset, we find people going into Zambia on an outreach or whatever, and the people sit in front of their hut. And you ask them, what are they doing? And they're saying, we are saving up time. I say, saving up time, how does that work? I'm resting. So when I get going in, time will progress, time will go forward. It's the person that's constant, not the time that's progressing. You might ask Michelle, what on earth does this mean within the workspace? Let me give an example. Many years ago, I was still a student. We had the opportunity to come together as church leaders throughout the city. Uh, I think at that stage, our mayor was Father Smangalichi Mukachua. He was a Roman Catholic priest, I think, before he became mayor. And he gave the city hall for a prayer event for many of our leaders across the city. Well, we were students, we got a little invite to a great moment, going to town, going to City Hall, with about 400 church leaders from across uh, the town coming together. And I remember sitting there behind some of our senior leaders in front of us, and they were talking about the fact that they're quite disappointed that a specific grouping of church leaders from Mamalori didn't pitch up for this event the morning, even though they RSVP'd and said they're going to come to this event. And I was listening, kind of overhearing this conversation, and uh, the morning started, and we had different pastors and duomenes and priests and everybody getting onto stage, or at least five minute uh, kind of popcorn prayers. And then the day was over by 11 o'clock, a two hour session. So everybody started moving out of the town hall, and as we kind of just left the building, and I don't know, by accident or whatever, we walked right behind this group of leaders. As we walked out of the building, this leader from Mamalori, with quite a large entourage, came walking into the building. And it was kind of, we got stuck there in the building because he had about 20 people with him. We were, everybody moving out, and so we got stuck in the door. And one of the leaders greeted this specific pastor. Um, he was quite an introvert and said, yes, pastor so-and-so, it's, it's wonderful that you guys can join us today. And then the words, we just sorry you missed the event. And this pastor looked at him and said, pastor, how can we miss the event if we just arrived? And I was listening to this and I thought, are you stupid? It's 10 past 11, the event is over. Not having any understanding of a worldview that was completely different. Your watch is not what guides me. We have now arrived. We're going to start praying. We're most probably going to pray till 5 o'clock this afternoon. But it's the person that's constant. How do we have weddings within Africa? How do we have funerals? within Africa. How do we have church and everything else? When the people are there, then we will start. Now throw these two extremes into one business part, into one non-profit part, into one educational part. How do we do goal setting? How do we talk about the future? How do we get a vision for this company? If we fundamentally start looking at life quite differently and we can start bashing heads. I'm very, very careful where I make comments like these, but I believe this would be a safe space. This is Michelle's view, so please take this and you're welcome to have a go with me afterwards during supper or whatever. 
But I am quite convinced after studying this for many, many years, that the fundamental challenge in Africa concerning our social economic crisis is perhaps not rooted in apartheid or colonialism or the lack of skill or any of those things. Yes, they contribute. Yes, they had a phenomenal challenge. I think it's a world issue. Because if you live constantly towards the past, let's look once again at African traditional religion. What is the belief? You venerate the ancestor. You think about the past and the ancestor will take care of the future for you. So if we have problems right now, it's because the ancestors are not happy. It's a past orientation. What do we see in every nation in Africa? We struggle to make progress. Let's look at some Western examples. Second World War, Germany, shot to bits and pieces. Let's look at Ireland, 80s, Protestants, Catholic, bombing the hell out of each other. What happened post that? Got the people together. What do we need to do? We need to consider where we're going in the future. A couple of years later, Germany once again rise to one of the strongest economies in the world. Look at Ireland, one of the most livable countries in the world because the inhabitants had a future orientation. So when it comes to progress, it does seem that the Western mindset, and also that's what we've seen throughout history, if you look at Greece and Rome and all these guys, it helps a nation to be established and to grow forward. Where on the African side, we might have certain challenges. Now that's one example. I want to give you a second example because in light of this, it seems like Africa is not with us. So let me change the scenario around when it comes to social infrastructure. <laughs> the African world believes in Ubuntu. It is a worldview statement. Now let me be very clear about this. I'm a white guy that have studied Ubuntu quite extensively. I have read a lot of it. I have no idea what it is. Let me be very honest about that. I want to find a Western white person who tells me, fundamentally, I know what Ubuntu is. I'm not talking about believing in Ubuntu. I'm not even talking about the value. I'm talking about the lens that you look at the world and say, I cannot have an individual identity because my identity is formed by the community. I am because we are. That's a way of looking at life. My Western background, which comes from what we call secular society, believes in individualism. I train my kids. I raise my kids that way. I was raised that way. Michelle, you're an individual. You need to grow up. You need to become strong. You need to deal with the fact that life is going to be hard. And your community is most probably going to be the greatest struggling block you need to work through. And then we come together as a bunch of individuals and we make choices. We call that democracy. I just have a funny feeling. I'll perhaps leave that question there. Can democracy ultimately work in Africa? I'm not so convinced. Because if I have to choose the corporate identity, but my very identity is dependent on that corporate identity or collective identity, how on earth do I do that? I cannot go against the very identity formers. Let's leave that for a for a moment. Perhaps just something to consider. Because where democracy comes from is a worldview that says every person has an individual call and an individual opportunity, and the majority together will select the community or the expression. So what happens within Africa? We have extreme high values of how we take care of people. The concept of it takes the village to raise the child. It's not just the single parents. It's the whole village coming together. It's brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, all of these people. A strong, healthy orientation. When people grow old, we don't throw money at the problem and put them in an old age home and visit them perhaps once a month. Now they move back in with the children and they understand to change their role going forward that we are now here to help and to serve. We are no longer in charge. I had a long conversation in one of our training seminars. One of the ladies, an African lady, challenged me and said, Michelle, it's horrible what you whiteies do towards your parents. You put them, you know, in these places. And I said, listen, it is not us necessarily. If I had to brought in my father and mother and my parents-in-law, I would guarantee you if I offered them the option to move in with us or rather put them on the old age home, they'll go to the old age home. They don't want to move in with us. That's the mindset. Why? Because they don't want to relinquish their freedom. They don't want to relinquish their individuality because they want to be in control. Knowing that they're going to move into my house is going to impact that quite greatly. We don't see that in Africa. In Africa, it's the natural thing. The village takes care of each other. That's why most of the Western world is socially falling apart. 
We're just trying to fit something of relationships in this busy schedules, and we're living more and more in isolation and more and more in loneliness. That's something we need to go and learn from Africa. How do we do life together? Now, some of the smart guys that's been speaking on Worldview, I've read up to 27 different outflows of what Worldview is. Time being one of these concepts. Social infrastructure being another concept. But I think the correlation that we can draw between how we look at the world and how we walk back into our businesses, how do we sit around the table and find consensus concerning going forward, is a major, major challenge. You know, South Africa is the only country in the world, the only country, that indigenously hosts two worldviews. We have African and we have Western indigenously in this country. Every other nation in the world has a predominant worldview and then a couple of subcultures. The whole of Africa is predominant African. The rest of the Western world, America, Canada, South America, going up into Europe is predominant Western. And then obviously the Asian countries is predominant Asian. We have certain challenges here on a worldview level that way exceeds the traditional challenges that people within the business world would face. But I believe fundamentally that is one of God's gifts towards us. Because the reality is the world's becoming more multicultural. The world's becoming global village more and more. And if we can get this right, if we can figure out how do we have a conversation, how do we engage with one another, we've got something very special to offer the world. And I think that's exactly what Jesus tried to do. Jesus was it really not conforming to the typical Jewish standard? He had a different worldview, different approach altogether. The Jews didn't even know how to fit into their time because of the Hellenization of the world, the Western Greek Roman way of looking at it. Yet Jesus had a way to impact his disciples and specifically Paul to such an extent where Paul later writes and said, listen, for me there is no more Jew, there is no more Gentile, there's no more freeman, there's no more slave, there's no more women, there's no more men. I can deal with all of these different groupings. Or is there still a level of prejudice towards you are different than me? And how do we relate to that? Well, that takes a lot of maturity and a long, long time of grace that we need to grow. In. Here's one of the challenges we are faced with. All worldviews have certain commonalities. And one of those commonalities is the fact that all worldviews are faced with a challenge on the level of dualism. What does dualism mean? Dualism means we have two extremities of reality. In the Western worldview, to demonstrate this as a moment, our dualism is between what we call internal reality, that's everything inside of me, my thoughts, my emotions, my will, my consciousness and the external world. And I'm very aware that everything around me that's external, you guys are not part of me, I'm not part of you, not even the clothes I'm wearing is part of me, it's something that I dress myself. <laughs> and constantly, these two extremities are busy uh, in a tug of war with one another. So what do we do? We teach our children that they must have a strong internal locus of control. That's the nice psychology word. You need to be in control. You need to make choices. Because if you have an external locus of control, the world's going to dominate you. The world is going to shut you around. So here's my question. Where does God fit into that picture? Is God part of your internal reality? Well, logically, you can say no. Because if it was part of my internal reality, it means I am God. I'll get back to that in a moment. So the only option in the classic Western way is, let's put it within the external reality. He's outside of me. God is an entity on himself or by himself. So how do we deal with the external world? Well, very simple. Whatever shouts the loudest at us gets attention. So Monday morning, work is shouting. You run off to work. And somewhere along the line, you figure out, well, I need to get to the gym perhaps to do some sport, or I need to eat at least somewhere along the way. And then we skip a day or two, we don't really see the family and the children, and then they start really getting a little bit annoyed with us, and then we start moving towards that space again. You know, Ron mentioned the fact that my studies with Regent University was a very interesting journey. We started off the doctorate program with three years of coursework. Felt like undergraduate again, but just a PhD place. And we had this awful three-week cycle 
Every three weeks, there was major submissions. So week number one, you were completely burned out and you just had to get back to work because everything was behind. Week number two, your wife and children was really annoyed at you so you spent time with them only to get to week number three in your studies, you haven't done anything and then you study your recital only to repeat that cycle for three years. So here's the thing. By Sunday, we might be feeling a little bit guilty. Oh, I need to go to church. If you have a weak spiritual consciousness, you might even need a little pick-me-up in the middle of the week to go to a discipleship course or some midweek prayer event. Where is the only place in the world where the church is not growing? The Western world. In Africa and within the East, it is booming. Because God cannot fit in the external world because He doesn't shout at us. So we had a couple of bright spots, just by by that move God out of the external reality into our internal reality. And as I said earlier, the outcome of that was you become God. That is what is, by the way, known as the New Age Movement. The New Age Movement is not a religion. The New Age Movement is a philosophy of life which incorporates all sorts of religion because they couldn't deal with the fact that God can't fit into the external picture. So, then He must be part of me, hence I am now part of God. That is what New Age, in essence, is all about. Let me not go into detail with that. There is a fundamental problem with this. Because God's nature is not dualistic. God's nature, by definition, is what we call triune or trinitarian. We know God as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit. When we read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God says in the beginning when He made man, let us make man in our image and our uh, likeness. The same blueprint that he is, he used that same blueprint for us. It's quite interesting. Just one other reference. Genesis 1 verse 1. How God created the world. There's four Trinitarian constructs just locked up in that first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, it's not just a reference to the point, it's a reference to time. Time is a three-dimensional Trinitarian concept. Present, past, future. God who is a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created the heavens, which is not a space up there where He stays, it's rather space itself, which is three-dimensional for us, length, breadth, and width, and the earth. It wasn't the ball, He's talking about matter, which we get in three forms, fixed, gas, and liquid. God's blueprint of triune understanding is imprinted in all of nature. And the moment you go into a triune understanding, well, the first thing that happens, the tension of dualism is relieved. And we might get to a model that looks more like this. I am because I have a spirit, soul, and a body. I exist within three different realities, an eternal reality or a spiritual reality, my internal and external. You see, God doesn't fit in these bottom two. God exists in an entire reality by himself. When we go into Africa, what we sometimes lack to see is the internal reality because Africans are quite aware of the eternal or the spiritual reality. That's why spiritualism is so alive and so well in Africa. And then they connect that with the external world and ask, what do we do? How do we engage? When we go to the Far East, the external world gets forgotten quite often. And we see all these interesting monasteries and people living these ascetic lives, very aware of the internal reality and very aware of the spiritual reality. Once again, another form of dualism with some fancy names that we see. I believe what Jesus was trying to tell us, guys, this is who we are. Your internal reality is not a Sunday activity. Your eternal reality is not a spiritual thing that you do. Your eternal reality is who you are. So somebody once asked me, Michelle, which one of these realities is more important? It's like asking, well, is your spirit, your soul, or your body more important? And the obvious answer is neither. This is the reality that God created man to be. So if we create a working environment... And we say, you are not allowed to bring in one of the realities of who you are. It's an essence saying, listen, we need to chop off your arm while you are at work. We're not going to use that. If we want to create an environment where people flourish, if we want to create an environment where people are healthy, if we want to create an environment where a person can come with their wholeness, 
We need to find practical ways how we can take all of these realities and allow a form of expression within the workspace for that. And I believe that's why you're on a course like Life with Leadership and not just another leadership course. Is to constantly ask the question, how does these three realities overlap? You see, the fact is, irrespective of what you know of them, this is who you are. Our senses of observing, and I don't have time to go into that this afternoon, of becoming aware of what's going on in these realities might not have been fully mature, even though we are physically mature in our internal reality. When we look to the life of Jesus, we see four different ways that we can approach the world. The first way is known as the anti-approach. It's where we can say everything in the world is evil. It's demonic, it's from the devil, stay away. And from the church point of view, we've seen this with a group known as the Desert Fathers. They moved out of the cities, out of the towns, moved right into the desert, Qumran villages, all those kind of things, and say, we want nothing to do with the world. Go to hell. We'll wait here until whatever form of eschatology you might believe is going to happen. The second group is the contra approach. Say, listen, okay, we understand we need to influence the world to some extent. But you are there, we are here, there's still a great barrier between us and we don't really want to go there. But we'll do that only for the sake of missionary work or outreach or whatever. Then unfortunately as the pendulum swing. We get people within the pro-consciousness. Where the church and body of Christ looks exactly like the world. That's like when you throw salt on the meat and the f meat doesn't become more salty, rather the salt becomes more meaty. We look like the world, we act like the world, we do like the world, our morals like the world, our divorce figures is like the world, our fornication is like the world. We look like the world. You see, Jesus had another approach. We can call that the incarnational approach. Where he understood that, yes, I can have dealings with the prostitutes and the whores. And I can walk into the tax collector's office and we can have a conversation. And I can walk and face a government official and we can have a conversation. Or I can go to the lepers and the outcast of society and we have a conversation within that environment. I believe the only reason why Jesus understood how to do that is because he understood his own Trinitarian nature. The church thing, or the spiritual thing, or the eternal thing is not an event, it is who I am. Where I go, I take this reality and dimension with me. But also take my intellect and my emotions. And I'm also taking my external world in consideration. Do we create environments as leaders where people can feel free and feel safe to express who they are? Or do we want to try and force them into some quick cutter way? Sire concludes, he says, his challenge, we should all think in terms of worldview. That is, with a consciousness not only of our own way of thought, but also that of other people. So that we can first understand that idea that Stephen Covey introduced years ago in his seven habits, first seek to understand before being understood, and then genuinely communicate with others in a very pluralistic society. I want to leave you with these thoughts of Jesus. So nice how Paul just wrote it. He said, all this energy, all this life force, one of the translations says, issues from Christ. Everything comes from Him. Everything happens through Him. And still everything ends up with Him. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you a couple of minutes to reflect, and then we'll end with some questions if there are any. There are three questions that I would like to give you this afternoon. The first question, to what degree are you aware of your own worldview? That lens, that folder through which you look at the world. I'm not asking what do you believe. I had a coaching session with the executive the other day, and in one of the follow-up sessions she told Michelle, well, I believe everything that Christ says. See, yeah, that's quite a difference than believing it and actually seen through that same paradigm. Number two, when engaging another person, 
Do you consider the fact that their worldview might be different than your own? And what effect does that produce on your interaction? And then number three, what would the effect on your life and community be if you intentionally incorporated a more biblical, or let me use another term there, a more Trinitarian or a more triune approach towards reality and not try and fragment it in only the dualism. Can I give you a couple of minutes just to reflect that by yourself? And then we'll open the floor for questions.